the member state. Okay. Got to car carry on here, hopefully. Uh, member states of the United Nations created 17 goals for a sustainable planet. So far, we've covered 13 of these goals in our series. And this is our agenda for today. Our ad advocacy chair, Ro Rigney, will present the broad global perspective, excuse me, broad, broad global purpose and targets SDG number 14, life below water. Then our first speaker will be Liz Taylor of the Deep Ocean Exploration and Research. And she will speak to SDG 14 at a global level. Next, our guest speaker from Point Blue Conservation Science, Jaime Jonke, will discuss what is being done at the local level. Finally, and this is designed to be interactive, so we'll have a discussion and take questions after each guest speaker. As Paul noted, we will hear from TAM High School Model UN Club about their recent activities. Please note, oh, one first, one other item. Then finally, we will hear from our past president, Kim Weichel. Please note we are recording this event. Will everybody please unmute? Excuse me, will everybody please mute? <laughs> now to give a broad overview of number 14, SDG number 14, our advocacy chair, Ro Rigney. Take it away, Ro. Thank you, Skip. Um, so let me just set up my screen here. Okay. Um, in September of 2015, the United Nations member states adopted what was called the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And the Sustainable Development Goals, or what are known as the SDGs, are at the heart of it. These are a set of 17 goals that aim to build a better world for all people by the year 2030. It's a comprehensive and optimistic development agenda encompassing all of the 193 members of the United Nations. The SDGs cover a broad range of issues, as you can see, including poverty, hunger, sanitation, gender equality, climate change, peace, energy, social justice, and more. So these are goals for the world. It can be called a blueprint for a better future for people and the planet. Uh, next slide, please, Paul. So today we're focusing on SDG 14, Life Below Water. The goal of this SDG is to conserve and sustainably use the oceans, sea, and marine resources for sustainable development. And slide. So why it matters. I don't know that anybody here questions that, but uh, next slide, Paul. Our ocean, which is our planet's largest ecosystem, is endangered. Slide. There are five broad areas of concern um, with the ocean and under the umbrella of this SDG. Plastic pollution, plastic is choking the ocean. About 17 plus million metric tons of plastic entered the ocean in 2021, and it's projected to double or triple by 2040, unless we can do something to change that. Ocean warming is from global warming, the overall temperature is increasing. Eutrophication has to do with harmful algal blooms, dead zones and fish kills because of an increased load of nutrients that are put into the ocean. Acidification is when the ocean absorbs more and more carbon dioxide that we are putting through our activity into the air, it becomes more acidic and this is threatening marine life. Also overfishing is moving some species towards extinction, and it's also upsetting the ocean ecosystems. Slide. So the UN created targets and indicators for each SDG. 
Number 14 has targets that you can see here. That in, and each target has indicators, which are supposed to be having a watchful eye upon them uh, by every country, every member state. Um, these targets include re to reduce pollution, conserve coastal and marine areas, to support small scale fishers and subsidies, and to end subsidies contributing to overfishing. And uh, that's, that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ro. Uh, we're gonna have our first speaker now. Uh, and she will be Liz Taylor of Deep Ocean Exploration and Research. Liz has been involved with DOER, which is, I believe, Deep Ocean, I have the exact thing, Deep Ocean Exploration and Research, that stands for. Uh, and she has became president of that society in, in 1994. The company designs and builds submersibles and other subsea systems for applications ranging from ocean exploration to infrastructure inspection. She has been involved in projects relating to uh, ocean exploration, coastal restoration, water management, levees and watersheds. She advocates for protecting public access to the water and broadening water competency. She is an advisor to Cal Mar Maritime and the Wild Oyster Project and served on the Deep Water Horizon Study Group. She has participated in more than 60 scientific diving and educational ocean exploration projects, including three Explorer Club flag expeditions. Taylor co-hosts the Dive In with Liz and Sylvia series produced by the Ocean Elders. She has authored numerous articles and white papers. Taylor is a recipient of the prestigious Wings World Quest Innovation Award, a fellow of the Explorer, excuse me, a fellow of the Explorers Club, and women, a Women's Divers Hall of Fame inductee. Now here is Liz, and I'll give you a heads up at the three minute warning. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Very pleased to be here with everyone today and uh, talking about SDG 14, life below water. Water connects us all. At DOER, Deep Ocean Exploration and Research, we're really focused on building the tools and technology for helping us to further our understanding of what's going on deep below the surface. So we, we start off building a number of um, tools. This is a example of a remotely operated vehicle. Um, this particular one was built, interestingly enough, for a, a mega yacht where the owner really wanted to understand what was going on below the surface. He was fully um, investigating his natural curiosity about the water. And if you can see, search to the front of the vehicle, there's a couple of folded down arms and each of those arms had a, a, a 12 foot span of lights and major broadcast quality cameras. And he just accrued a great library of information about life below water. And, you know, getting into these areas is, is quite challenging. This is another the remotely operated vehicle that has a tether management system attached to the top of it. Um, this particular one can get to about 6,500 meters below the surface, but it's useful for investigating everywhere in between. So we've used this in very shallow water um, over in Hawaii, all the way down into the some of the deepest uh, parts of the ocean. We start off with some fairly modest uh, bits and pieces, trying to make things um, easy to deploy around the world. So a modest 20-foot shipping container, as you see here, we turn these into mission modules of various kinds. This, this particular one is being used for a control room. So you can see all the 
people in the front that are operating the vehicle, uh, seeing the different camera angles, the views, um, creatures going by. And then in the back are more of the science party. And we oftentimes will give the scientists the, the capacity to directly control the cameras on these vehicles so they can really understand and, and chase down the, the fishes and other animals that they're looking for in the deep sea. So having these very uh, capable systems allows us to discreetly sample and get good video records with direct uh, real-time observations coming back to the surface. They're oftentimes used in simultaneous operations, in this case with a scuba diver, and we've also used them with autonomous vehicles and with human-occupied vehicles. Here's a close up of one of those manipulator arms that we build here at DOER. This particular arm has been served, served us very well across a number of platforms, both human occupied and robotic vehicles. Uh, Jim Cameron famously used this arm on his full ocean depth submersible, although in his case, he attached a full ocean depth Rolex watch to the wrist of it and, uh, and took it down and back. So it's a, it's a really interesting way to be able to discreetly pick up things where it can break off a chunk of rock for a geologist or very discreetly pick off a small sponge or or a piece of coral and bring that sample back to the surface without destroying the you know entire animal and the surrounding habitat we've gone to on to explore some really extreme areas uh, looking for extremophiles below water this particular vehicle was designed for a university group that needed to go below the Antarctic ice shelf. So we took that common architecture of the traditional ROV form and we stretched it out like a, like a limousine and, and put, put all these different sensors and accoutrement on there. It had carried 27 different sensors and it had to fit through a 24 inch borehole that was uh, melted through the ice and go through a thousand meters of ice to get out below the surface and explore underneath. This is it during uh, some testing at Lake Tahoe. That's one of our one of our favorite places to test vehicles, and we often remind people that you know life below water is not just about the ocean, but it also means fresh water. And we we really look at these big watersheds and how they connect to the ocean. It's all part of that big water cycle. That, that people don't often think about the connectivity between the between all of it but it goes from the as we say from the sierra to the sea uh, locally here and here's that big rov uh, system that we built for university of hawaii the lulakai and as you can see this vehicle has a lot going on it's got multiple cameras and lights and sonars and multiple manipulator arms two different types here um, a big drawer in the front that can carry samples and and again it's used to to help us investigate about what's going on under the water and to support other types of technology such as ocean observing systems and uh, landers and things of that nature that we can just put out to collect information for long periods of time and, and bring this, that data back. One of its most important jobs recently has been to go out to the clarion Clipperton Ridge Zone, or the CCZ. And this is the area that's being targeted for deep sea mining. Um, these are some of the, the small nodules or tectites that are found uh, out in that region. They're just kind of scattered across the, the seabed um, throughout that zone. And they can be, in some areas, quite uh, high density of them. And they can get, they can be smaller ones like this, so they can get up to kind of like, you know, large potato size. But the thing about them that we really don't think about too much is that these are living uh, systems. And so the bacteria in the ocean, they help to precipitate out these, the metals, the rare earth metals that uh, the miners want to go get to help us build car batteries or smartphones or, you know, what other um, things we wish to build. But at the very heart of them, is it starts around a biological kernel of some kind. So they're almost like very slow growing ocean pearls. 
and they provide not only um, the substrate on the seabed, but a lot of animals use that substrate. There's a species of octopus that, that scientists believe nest, nest nowhere else except on these, these deep sea nodules. And the seabed in, these, in this region is just so fine. The sedimentation is very, very light. And what happens, even when you go very carefully with an ROV on a science mission, coming down very gently, picking up discrete samples of of um, deep sea animals or a nodule for further study. Um, even that creates a sediment plume that endures for many, many hours. And the thought of being able to build, you know, huge sort of combine sized uh, robotic systems to, to just strip these things off the seabed, it will just create these regions. So how do we get people to really understand, we're near people to understand and think about life below water. <laughs> it's to you know, really come to value the ocean alive, fish alive versus landed tons of wildlife or barrels of oil or loads of nodules uh, from the seabed. You know, and one of those ways is to, is to spend time below water. Uh, here, uh, Sylvia Earle is inside of the Aquarius habitat. The Aquarius habitat is situated in the Florida Keys, and it's at this point it's the the only uh, deep sea habitat that's left in functioning today. There's a couple of underwater you know hotels, but they're kind of attached to the surface in various ways. But this is a true standalone habitat, and there used to be a couple of dozen of them around, but this is the last one now, and you can see just that that it's been inhabited and encrusted by a whole host of of animal life on it. Another way, of course, is through art. And I'm really a, a huge advocate of reconnecting art and science and exploration. These uh, shapes, I'll call them, were uh, part of a installation we did at Catalina Island for the artist Doug Etkin. And each one of these shapes was submerged at a different depth some of them have textured panels, some of them had mirrored panels, but we situated them in the Catalina uh, diving park and basically waited to see what would happen. And what happened is that we had, you know, sea lions and Garibaldi and uh, kelp bass and, and the giant sea bass that all investigated these things and just had the most, most interesting interactions with them. In addition, of course, to all the scuba divers, but the Garibaldi were particularly funny. They, they would kind of, you know, attack themselves in the mirrored panels, but they really came to realize they were kind of looking at themselves. So they, they developed some self-awareness there. It was pretty interesting. And of course, the, the, the marine mammals, the sea, the sea lions, uh, they just kind of barrel rolled right through and, and just had a wonderful time with these during their deployment. But our true passion here at DOER is in building and operating human occupied vehicles. So these little submersibles really give us the gift of time to really understand what's going on below the surface and to interact with life underwater. Um, these particular uh, subs, we're building a pair of these right now. that will be used in Tahiti, uh, operated by the Tetiora Society. And they'll be um, hopefully working with a number of the scientists over on uh, Morea and other university uh, over there to really help to understand what's going on in the South Pacific. It's an area that's in extreme um, risk of sea level rise, many of these very low atolls. And, you know, change happens, I think, faster than we, than we really um, realize. So we're really looking forward to seeing these coming online uh, in the next year or two. And here's a couple uh, of the other submersibles we've worked on in the past. Um, these were used, you know, they've been around for some time now, but they were used during the Titanic uh, movie. And uh, they, they typically will be in the background holding the lights, operating the cameras, so you don't really see them too often, but they're real workhorses. It's kind of a close up of this one. You can see the big lights at the top. This, this particular submersible holds two people. Um, and again, it's really a very nice, stable uh, film platform. 
The Pisces submersibles were based over at University of Hawaii. They've since been um, put into layup just because of budget constraints and cutbacks there. But we had a wonderful opportunity to take these, a pair of these submersibles, um, diving them together. And we took a group of students uh, out in these that never really had much experience in the ocean at all. It was for a, for a film project. And some of these kids were kind of inner city youth. They never, they lived kind of adjacent to the ocean, but they'd never really been out in the ocean. And as part of that you know, program, they got to learn to scuba dive. And then we took them down in submersibles. And, you know, this is the kind of little community you find deep in the ocean. I took this picture with my iPhone out the, out the port of the submersible. And it was a Amazing to see this, this this little cluster of so much going on here and, and really wondering like why are they all clustered together like this? What what is really happening in this in this one shot? And without that ability to really sit there and watch the interactions, see what other animals come in, ones that aren't really attached to the seabed like these guys are, um, you really begin to to understand what all the different intricacies of what's going on in the deep sea. Here's a system we have currently under build. This is the frame, uh, the C frame for the main sphere and the sphere under build and all polished up, just about ready to put into the frame. But, you know, there's another way, there are other ways that we can really get people to think about um, getting out there and exploring directly, directly exploring the ocean. And one of them, of course, is to, you know, visit your local your local dive shop and to get in there and start to you know put that get that face mask on just get into the water and start looking below the surface don't let that curiosity that you have be quashed by everything else going on in your life but get into the water to that end we collaborate with um, mission blue and deep hope um, mission blue has the hope spots there's dozens of them now around the planet, but they're areas where ordinary people have decided that place really matters to them, and they think that it deserves some greater attention and protection. And so, so through the Mission Blue um, nomination process, uh, ordinary people are able to nominate the uh, hope spot. They have to find a collaborating scientist, a local scientist, and then the, the entire uh, application is vetted by the IUCN. And with any luck, they eventually get um, acknowledged as an official hope spot. And one of those official hope spots is San Francisco Bay. <laughs> so some years ago, actually just a few years ago, um, Sylvia Gibson, the, the blonde haired lady here on the left, uh, right, whichever way it is for you, uh, she's based right here in Alameda. And she came through our dive shop and expressed some interest in nominating the San Francisco Bay as a hope spot. And at that point, we had uh, Karina Nielsen, who was at the time uh, um, heading up the Romberg Center over in Tiburon. And so they uh, collaborated on it. I helped out as I could, and they did get it um, approved as a hope spot. And there's the Romberg Estuary Ocean Science Center over there in Tiburon. If you haven't been there, you should go. It's a really cool place. And here we are right at Point Molate and just seeing the eelgrass beds that, that they're working hard to restore. And similarly, eelgrass, turtle grass, all these sea grasses are such a vital uh, carbon sequestering uh, plant and, and really applauding the efforts all around the different hope spots where people are working to restore these, these seagrass and eelgrass meadows. Um, we just were working with a group in Florida to work on the turtle grass beds there to um, help both the manatees and the carbon sequestration. But right here, you know, we're making a difference as well in getting these, these uh, meadows protected and in some cases restored, you know, replanting areas that have been you know, trawled or otherwise damaged over time. And who really is out there that needs the life below water in order to survive above water. But many of our beautiful local birds, these are the, the animals that really rely on ocean wildlife for food. Um, 
and most humans just just don't. <laughs> we can we can get by without eating a lot of the ocean wildlife, but these guys absolutely need it. As do these. And trying to get people to understand the connectivity um, that that goes on between the, the eelgrass meadows and our local oysters and restoring these oysters um, wherever you may find them. It's not just here in the in the Bay Area, although you know here we're working to get the native oysters uh, restored. But in other parts of the world too, there, there are things that you can um, you can do in one area that can lead by example in other areas. These oyster balls and oyster, um, I don't know what they call them, the shapes of various kinds. Uh, they're really kind of little building blocks that can be as oysters, but for other animals as well. Uh, we've done this around you know, mangrove areas, other areas that have been degraded uh, primarily by dredging or by use of riprap along coastal areas where you can really look to find ways and means to protect the shoreline or rebuild the shoreline in ways that are friendly and conducive to restoring some of the native animals and plants that really will give you a uh, much higher return <laughs> on any uh, dollar that you put in, in infrastructure um, improvements. And we see these eroding coastlines uh, going on all over the place not just here in the San Francisco Bay, but it's a problem all around the world. Um, and looking at the small stuff, kind of understanding how everything is tied together, that these systems are, are very, very complex. And you know we can't just sort of patch one thing up here, one thing up there. We have to kind of look at these systems in a holistic way, um, whether it's a eelgrass bed or if it's a coral reef. Um, there's no kind of one, you know, one solution other than oftentimes just to give some really enduring protection to an area and let it kind of re rebound on its own. Ah, we're stuck here for some reason. <laughs> All right, well, I'm going to have to stop sharing my screen there because it's frozen, unfortunately. But you know, I really like to think about being able to to look at the ways that we're um, working together, and seeing that these the Mission Blue Hope Spot was just sort of the the tip of an iceberg. Uh, I think in the ways and means that we can start as a as a community to come to different. Um, Excuse me, one second, uh, Liz. Three, three minutes left. I'm sorry. Three minutes left. No. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry. I could cut my slides a little bit short because the the PowerPoint froze on me. But you know, I think that there's. I was just so pleased to see that we had uh, just last month the High Seas Treaty came. You know. Uh, you finally get some traction after 20 years of, of effort. But it's just, you know, at the same time, I was incredibly frustrated by it because we, knowing what we now know, we, we don't really have until 2030 to act. We really need to start finding ways and means that we can take action now to protect, uh, hopefully, you know, up to 30% before 2030 and, and maybe more by then as well. Um, so you know, again, water connects us all, and I'd love to hear more from from the viewers and listeners. Um, if you have questions, like what, how, how do you think we can get there at this point in time? Um, it seems a long time to wait to 2030 to really take some meaningful, tangible action, and I think the time is now. Thank you. Hey, thank, thank you, Liz. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, everyone now uh, can feel free to unmute and uh, let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Great graphics. Now we're going to now we're going to have um, Q&A for Liz and uh, 
I can only see one page at a time here, Rose, so. Okay, well, my hand is up. Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, thank you, Liz. That was really interesting. Great to see what you're doing over there and down there. I have a question. <laughs> Recently, I heard someone named Jeffrey Gordon Creed make a presentation, and he was speaking about a company that he started that plugs up methane leaking orphaned oil wells. Apparently there are 20 million of them around the world. Um, and yeah, it's a yeah, lot. <laughs> 90,000 in the Gulf alone. Yeah. Have yeah. you been involved in these efforts at all? Or do you know much about what's going on with them? Thank you. Well, I don't know too much about that particular company, but but this the problem is huge and it, it's real. And what happens oftentimes is that you know, one company will go in and they'll they'll get a license to to drill or do exploration of some kind, and no, and you know that's fine and well, and they're regulated and and so on and so forth. But then you know something happens, a, a leak happens, a hurricane happens, something goes on, and these companies will just sort of disappear and along with and just leave this this problem behind. <laughs> and it's like, how do you address this? So we. We really do need a, a more holistic way and approach to to deal with some of these abandoned and orphaned um, platforms and, and wellheads and things because they do continue to leak. And you know we've built some we've built some some wild apparatus over the years to they, they look kind of like a big funnel that the ROV has to carry and and set down over some of these leaking um, spaces to try to identify if it's like a natural methane seep or is there a buried pipeline there because there's so much. If you look at a map of the of the Gulf of Mexico and at all the different pipelines that are crisscrossed and overlaid and and on top of each other, I mean it's it's mayhem. <laughs> it's, it's it's just unbelievable. Um, but how just the network of old pipelines out there. Um, but because things are underwater, it's mostly out of sight, out of mind. Um, when we really do need to to think about how do we mitigate some of this stuff, and that it sounds like this like this. Uh, Company is taking an approach to try to plug some of those pipelines um, and you know the, the orphaned ones that are just left abandoned like that. But we do need some better um, rules or regulations or strategies to think about the entire, you know, again, to look at these things in a holistic way. If we really have to go get um, oil out of the out of the bottom of the sea, you know, how are we going to do it in a way that is truly responsible and not just sort of like try to pass the buck or or abandon these platforms unilaterally when they're done. Thank you. We have another question here, Herb. Herb yeah, Bain. thank you very much. Um, Elizabeth, thank you very much for your presentation. And of course, we can see the great work that you're doing. The question is, what are you seeing are the most important ways that the life under ocean, underwater, is actually being threatened and destroyed from plastics, mining, oil, whatever it is. And what are some of the things in your vast global experience you're seeing are the remedial steps? And in that light, you know, among the things, uh, both for the UN to work on and the US and, and maybe in the Bay Area, but in that light also with the new UN agreement on uh, uh, deep water, the oceans agreement, do you think that that, it, I mean, it's a, a great first step, but what is it going to do? And is it going to go far enough? And where do you see the gaps looking ahead at the action and priorities? Big question. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a multiple, multiple, multi-part question. <laughs> but, you know, again, we, we really need to, the first thing we need to do is to, you know, stop treating the ocean like a sewer simultaneously. And that, and we seem to do that really well. Um, it just seems that the ocean is so big and so vast that we can dump whatever we want there, you know, be it, uh, you know, plastics, old munitions, waste, DDT, what, you know, whatever it is, we've dumped it out there and it's out of our sight. So we don't think about it until it comes back to bite us, um, which it's doing. Um, so, you know, I think some of the, some of the best things, best first things that we can do uh, include, you know, really scaling back the, the industrial fishing that's going on around the world. Um, you know, we just can't continue to take out these these this enormous amount of biomass and and expect no problems. You know, the, these um, 
things like you know squid and uh, krill, you know, Antarctic krill fishery. You're like, what are they thinking? <laughs> it's, you know, it's just it, it's like it's gutting the base of the food chain out of the Antarctic. Um, you know, it, it's, you know, we really don't need krill oil in order to get um, you know omega three fatty acids in our diet. And so it's a uh, it's like see that we that we see that kind of stuff happening and can't really um, seem to get enough uh, critical mass to kind of empower consumers to make better choices and and really be the drivers of the of the change that we need I mean I think that's that's one all kind of advocate for is to you know just trying to educate people to think about the real implications of popping a krill pill every day <laughs> a good thing um and then really helping people to connect the dots in okay. looking at ocean okay. health based on um, upstream health so you know looking at at the, the great watersheds and how we uh, really take it when we take care of water up you know upland it does help the ocean you know, whether it's trying to curb agricultural runoff um, you know, from flooding and this sort of thing. We see these big dead zones that are created uh, post hurricanes and post um, floods just because of the huge pulses of contaminated water that are that are released into the ocean. So working upstream, it doesn't matter if people are landlocked, they can still make a huge difference. And I think people need to know that, um, that they can if all these little things they do in their daily lives can impact and they shouldn't feel hopeless that there's nothing they can do because there's plenty that can be done. With, with permission, and I know time is tight, but uh, you know this new agreement in the last couple of months is one of the first steps uh, in the last 10 years to do something about the SDGs. Can you uh, very briefly say, I mean, is this just a, a sellout or is it really going to have some impact and is it well-focused to, to save the oceans and deal with the things you've said? I know I'm taking time, but that seems to be no, I think it's, for you I and think it, the it, crooks. It, it is really important, but it, you know, waiting until 2030 to see it implemented, it, you know, we don't have that much time. We need to get on it now. And, and I think that's, you know, the, not to, not to just sort of sit on our hands and go, oh, by 2030, we'll have 30%. It's like, no, we need to do that right now. <laughs> you know, maybe another 30% by 2030, but, you know, the time is now to, to start really meaningful protection. Um, for much more of the ocean and the land. I know it's, it's 20, it's 30, 30 by 30, 30% on the land and the water um, by 2030. But we want to get, I'd love to see it, you know, 30% now and another 30 by 2030. Uh, right. Annette Miller. I want to say how appreciative I am of all the work that Elizabeth is doing. Thank you. But in my naivety, I believe that these large companies have one thing in mind, and that's the big fat dollar. Why don't we charge them when they're being very, very naughty? Yeah, I, I agree with that there. You know, we, we don't need to be subsidizing, you know, industrial fishing or mining or even oil and gas extraction. We need to instead be redirecting those dollars into uh, you know habitat right. protection and and really protecting fresh water as well as ocean water you know protecting it all okay uh looks like we have time for one more question i thought i saw paul had his, his little emoji hand up there i had my hand up but i uh i want to ask the question for james but uh, uh james t uh, but first, I want to acknowledge uh, who's been speaking uh, and asking a question to her Burstock. Uh, thank you. In fact, you helped get uh, Liz as uh, Liz Taylor as a speaker. So thank you for, very much for that. Uh, and uh, in fact, Herb is a, a former senior official in, in the UN. He worked in the United Nations and now the president of the Northern California Division of the chapters in this region. So thank you. Thank you, Herb. And then Annette Miller just spoke, who is a, a former board member of this local chapter. So uh, uh, what, the last question will be from James. Uh, and he says, uh, what can we do besides regulations? Uh, clearly, they do not, do not get enforced globally, no matter what. 
we need bodies everywhere, it seems, reinforcing this since government's art. So he's, I guess he's making a plea for uh, non-governmental organizations. What do, what do you think about that? Well, yeah, I mean, and non-governmental organizations are, can, can clear, clearly do a lot and are doing a lot. Um, and I think, you know, some of the most important things that we can do, again, as as individuals that are concerned is, you know, leading by example and, and getting kids engaged, um, get that sort of that, you know, that bottom up power, <laughs> they can kind of percolate up and, and kind of drive the change, you know, and, and for God's sakes vote, you know, <laughs> and he, every, every single election. Um, but I mean, we really need better engagement in getting, getting kids back out into, you know, not just, the the three R's, but you know, getting them back out into the field and getting them um, some experience, some direct experience, and you know, no, as, as Sylvia likes to say, no child left dry, and and um, I really think that just by direct engagement, you know, reconnecting art and science, and and getting out there um, and understanding that you know these individual choices that we have every day can can really add up when enough of us all pull together in the same positive direction. Good, good. That's, that sounds like the right, the right direction. Thank you, Liz, very much. Um, now, uh, Ro is, has got a, an announcement, I'm told. Yeah, Paul, you want to show the next slide? Um, so for uh, more information about uh, deep ocean exploration research, the Liz, Liz's um, company over in the East Bay, doermarine.com, you can see all of the fantastic things going on over there. This information will also be included in an email that is um, coming up to you after this event uh, in the near future with a link to the event recording. Thanks. Okay, thank you, Ro. Our second speaker today is Jaime Janke, PhD from Point Blue Conservation Science who will speak to the SDG at the local level. Jaime is director of the California Current Group at Point Blue Conservation Science and adjunct pr professor at San Francisco State University's Estuary and Ocean Science Center. That's a mouthful. He works to increase the pace, scale, and impact of uh, climate smart conservation in the ocean. His work with Point Blue's Ocean Conservation Initiative includes developing science and tools to improve fisheries sustainability, guide ocean zoning, and build support for ocean conservation. He also works with federal and state agencies, academia, environmentalists, and NGOs. Take it away, Jaime. Thank you, Skip. I will share my presentation. Can you see my slides? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Thank you. So um, I'm going to do today is provide, uh, provide an update about uh, ocean conservation work that we have been conducting uh, within Point Blue. Um, so Point Blue Conservation Science is a nonprofit founded in 1965 as the Point Reyes Bird Observatory. We are about 180 people, and we have a budget of about $16 million. And our mission is to conserve birds, all their wildlife, and ecosystems through science, partnership, and outreach. Within the work that I do, which focuses on oceans, we try to conduct applied science to guide ocean management and reduce threats to wildlife and ensure sustainable human uses. And the invitation from today from, uh, uh, was to uh, try to see how does Point Blue's ocean research aligns with the United Nations um, ocean targets. So that's what I'm gonna try to do. Ro provided a great introduction about the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So I'm gonna skip most of that, just to say that I'm fo focusing on goal 14, conserve, uh, conserve and sustainably use oceans, life below water. I'm gonna skip this slide as well. Uh, Point Blue 
contributes to five out of the 10 uh, targets that uh, Ro described early on on this uh, on her presentation. And I'm going to be uh, trying to provide a quick science update about each one of them. In the first one is we have been working to address marine debris and pollution. And what we're doing here, that's a finger with pieces of plastic, not my photo here. Uh, what we have been doing here is uh, we have been trying to understand if there is incidence of plastic in the fish that are being consumed by birds on the Farallon Islands. And in this case, you can see in the photo, those are rhinoceros oclets, those, those are birds that nest in, on the Farallon Islands, and they consume northern anchovies, which are brought to the colony to feed the chicks um, every day. And we have sampled, we have collected a few of these fish uh, and kept them in the freezer for several years. And we looked at a few of these fish collected between 2004 and 2020 to understand if the fish contain plastic inside of them. From about 150 fish that we uh, sampled, we found that 100 of them had plastic inside of them. So that's about 60, 66% of them had plastic. And on average, it was about two or just over two particles per fish. Um, most of the flat plastic that we found, 65%, were microfibers. Some of that comes from our clothing. Some of that comes from uh, ropes and gear used in the ocean. In fact, most of them were uh, human-made cellulose. But we also find uh, plastic fragments and spears and others. And it's just what we're doing now is to try to understand how that plastic, what the incidence of plastic in several species of seabirds on the parallels. We're looking, we're, we'll be looking into five different species and then trying to understand the potential health and uh, impacts of that. Another area where we, where we have been working uh, quite a bit is in the, air, uh, in the target of sustainably managing ocean ecosystems. Here you have a blue whale and you can see a ship in the background. And one of the things that we're doing is trying to understand what to do to prevent and protect whales from ship strikes. Every year of, um, about 80 whales are killed by ships of the US West Coast. About 18 of them are endangered blue whales, about 22 of them are humpback whales, and about 43 of them are fin whales. And that's quite a, quite a large number here. It's larger than what NOAA states we can take on an annual basis. This figure shows uh, the distributions of mortality for the blue humpback and fin whale species of the US West Coast. And what I want you to see here is that when you look at blue whales on the left, most of the red and yellow, most of the mortality is happening in Southern California, but there's a little bit of Northern California, uh, San Francisco. When you look at humpback whales, most of the red and yellows are happening off San Francisco, and a, a few of that is happening down South. But when you look at fin whales, most of the red and yellows where, where the mortality is happening, is happening while the vessels are transiting North to South, uh, parallel to the coast between San Francisco and the port of LA, Long Beach. And I can share publications if you guys wanted to read more about this. Since 2014, um, NOAA has been working on a vessel speed reduction program where vessels are asked to uh, slow down, down to about uh, 10 knots when coming in and out of the San Francisco Bay and we're transiting uh, around the Channel Islands, going into the Long Beach, LA port. And we have been helping NOAA, I guess, estimate the effectiveness of their slowdowns and to measure how many wells they are saving through those uh, regulations. And as an example here, this table shows, again, the number of vessels that participate, how many companies, how many, um, the miles, um, transit at slow speeds and so on. But if you look at the last row, you will see that we were we measured for them that in 2020, mortality of whales decreased by about 35 percent. And in 2021, mortality decreased by about 50 percent. So slowing down saves whales. It also decreases ocean noise and it also decreases green, uh, the green, greenhouse gas uh, emissions from those vessels. 
Another example of work that we're doing within this target is uh, trying to help whales uh, protect them from entanglements. And here you see that from 2017 to 2021, about 138 whales were confirmed entangled of the US West Coast. Three of them were blue whales, 41 of them were gray whales, 94 of them were humpback whales. And that is, that is, I guess, a sad, a sad thing to see. And there's very little we can do to really save the animals when this happens. Sometimes they untangle themselves, sometimes they're untangled by uh, an specialized team that goes out there to rescue them. Sometimes there's nothing we can do. The, and the reason for the entanglements is that the animals migration has been changing over time. And this figure shows humpback whales on the left, blue whales on the right. At the bottom, you can see years from 1993 to 2016. And in the vertical axis, it's just dates. And the only thing that I want you to focus on is on the blue lines. And you can see that on the left side of the panels, uh, arrival of the whales used to be at the end of summer, early fall, and whales used to leave around November, December. And now, more recently, if you look at 2016, whales are arriving around April, May, June in the spring, and then leaving similarly at about November, December. So whales are arriving much earlier now than they did 30 years ago, which means that they are overlapping with the crab fishery a lot more now than they did before. The crab fishery happens from, used to happen from mid-November to um, late June. And they, during that overlap, there was quite a few animals that were threatened by the, by the ropes in the water. This figure shows that most of the, of the entanglements have been happening between May and June. And the closure that we have now of the fissure, is, uh, which is much earlier, um, protects them from that, that potential threat. I don't know whether you guys know, but uh, the fissure now opens later. It opened in mid-December last year. And CDFW just announced that the craft fishing will be closing by April 15, which protects the whales that are starting to arrive already. Another target is to address impacts of ocean acidification. And this is very, very new science for us at Point Blue. Um, in this figure, you see uh, sea butterflies. Those are pteropods. They are kind of like the, the canary in the coal mine for ocean acidification. And what we have been doing here is that we help develop methods to estimate um, ocean acidification in our area. Um, and, and by that, I mean, to estimate the availability of aragonite in the water. And aragonite is a form of calcium used by um, organisms that produce the shell to, uh, I guess, to take and absorb the calcium that they need to build up their shell. So we work and collaborated with a bodega marine lab and some graduate students there to develop an equation that allows us to estimate aragonite based on temperature, salinity, and dissolved oxygen. And have been using that equation of samples we collect at sea on the boat to estimate at our night saturation over time. And what we found is that, no surprisingly, the waters of the coast of California tend to be acidic. In the red, you can see here, acidic waters. In the blue are less acidic waters. And the idea is that this boundary of about one in the night saturation separates the acidic from the non-acidic waters or the less acidic waters. Um, what is in the red are areas where um, shell organisms are having a hard time building a shell. Waters in the blue area are areas where those organisms have no problem, let's say, building a shell. And because the waters in this in our coast come from deep, come, come from a welling from deep sea water, it tends to be water with high carbon dioxide, water which uh, which are naturally somewhat acidic, but right now we can see an additional impact from human, uh, from humans, from the excessive amount of CO2 that we have released in the environment. And one of the consequences of this is, um, here we see again, the, uh, the and a slide showing pteropods that are just, uh, under the dissolution of the shells on the left side. 
And we're seeing that when we have waters that are, have less, and the figure on the right shows our organoid saturation on the bottom from 0.4 to a higher value, and the, the count of uh, limacinas in, the, in our samples. And the point here is that when the water is acidic, we tend to see less of these animals in our samples when the water has no limitation on the amount of aragonite that they need to build their shells, we tend to see larger numbers. So ocean acidification is having already an impact uh, on the biology that we have of our coast. Another target that we, where we have been working uh, is that and um, overfishing to help restore fish stocks. And what we have been doing here is really on using the data that we collect in the Fire Islands to help better manage some of the fishery that we all care about. And as you know, in this case, uh, so the, the birds in the Far Islands were decimated during the gold rush to a very low numbers uh, during the egging and then due to mortality in fisheries and, uh, and other impacts. So those birds have been recoveries and their numbers have been increasing and they're not yet at the population level that, you, that they used to have. So what I show here is the amount of fish needed by the birds in the Farland Islands from 1986 to 2015. And just to make the point that the low populations that we had in the 1980s needed about 10,000 metric tons of fish to survive. But by 2015, the 300,000 birds that we had at that time needed, needed about 60,000 um, metric tons of fish to survive. And this is important because some of the fisheries that we have, the quota, the harvest quota has not been changing over time. And we have been trying to influence that. Here you see that if we look at the common MERS as an example, for the whole West Coast, they need about 100,000 metric tons of, um, of anchovy. And if we look at the, uh, and they need about 40,000 metric tons of rockfish uh, to make a living uh, along the coast. And we have used this information to impact some of the management of these two species, for example, we share our findings with the Pacific Fisheries Management Council. And because of our research, um, they uh, did some revisions to how the Northern Anchovy uh, is managed. They now consider predator needs and they now require stock assessments to determine new harvest quota every year. The harvest quota that we had was 25,000 metric tons per year and was established in 1985. I had not changed in uh, almost, what, 30 years? Another thing that we were able to impact is that we prevented the establishment of a new directed fishery for rockfish, which is a critical prey for Farallon seabirds. Um, I assume I'm still good on time. So one last target is uh, we have been working to conserve coastal and marine areas. And we were uh, influential in the establishment of the Cordell Bank, Greater Farlands and Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuaries. But since the establishment, we have been collaborating with them to assess uh, what goes on in the sanctuary. We conduct cruises together where we look at the physical oceanography, the chemical oceanography, and everything that happens with the biology from the phytoplankton, the krill, to the birds, whales, and turtles. And we use that information to um, inform some of the um, management practices that are uh, implemented within the sanctuaries. We uh, target indicators that were prioritized by, by the sanctuaries and the stakeholders, and we will provide that information to them we put together reports and all these things that uh, make information available to them as part of the condition report and as part of the times when they are working on their new uh, management plan updates. And that's happening literally right now. We, we have been collaborating with them to share uh, what's happening, the status and trends, what's happening with the priority species they care about so they can build condition reports and they are due to update their management plan um, starting June next year. So we will be collaborating on that. So in summary, we have been able to 
uh, provide information that that targets uh, five of the priorities from the uh, from goal of fourteen uh, by initiating science on microplastic and forest fish by conducting science to protect whales from ship strikes, entanglements, and other human impacts, by pioneering some ocean acidification research in Southern California, by using our science to influence fisheries management, and by helping establish and manage the sanctuaries of our coast. Um, that is all I had to say. Uh, the science we do is possible from contributions from people like you that make uh, this work possible. And thank you. Thank you, Jaime. Thank you very much. If you ever like to unmute, we can give him a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Thank you. You're right, but... We have a question from James, uh, Jaime, and that is um, that uh, the San Francisco government or governor seems to not be making any difference. What entity is in charge of enforcing shipping speeds, at least here in the Bay Area, or maybe you can address along California and the, the West Coast? Um, he, he, James, James writes, I would assume the entanglements and the ship hits are pretty significant given the migration changes and that the whales are coming earlier. Um, yes, yeah, so the question is like, who is responsible for um... I guess, uh, enforcing the speeds, right? Yeah. So, um, the slowdowns are voluntary to start with. Uh, so there is just basically have been quite a bit of outreach trying to request uh, companies to participate. And we have gone from about 25 participation uh, back in 2015 to about 65% overall participation uh, in the last couple of years. And all that is work conducted by our NOAA partners reaching out to the companies directly. Um, and the reason why they slow down, or the, the reason why they use the um, shipping lanes is basically, again, they get, they, it's related to the insurance and how that, that works. Um, the other part of the question is that whether the migration, the changes in the migration patterns have impacted the amount of ship strikes and time that we see now. And that is that is true, definitely. Um, uh, by the whales arriving earlier now than they did before, they are definitely more exposed to the gear during the fishing season. But another change that we have seen is that over the last, if I just talk about the last 10 years, we used to see that only about most of the whales forage, used to forage at the shelf break on krill. Uh, that's quite away from the coast. And we used to have only about 5% of our whale feeding within 20 miles from the coast. That number has, has increased to about 20 to 30% of the animals now are feeding within 20 miles on fish and the rest are feeding outside uh, on krill. That makes these animals um, overlap more in a space with the areas where the shipping lanes are located, which exposes them also to both fisheries and uh, potential ship strikes. Um, our information is all available to our partners and NOAA, and they are working really hard to figure out how to uh, do the changes necessary to minimize the risk. Okay, thank you. And uh, did I see Jesse at her hand up earlier? Um, we. We do have a comment. Um, Liz, did you want to share your um, thoughts, your notes here? Um, I just, I'll just put that in as in response to. Um, yeah, feel free to go ahead and add that. String. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to take away from other questions that people might have for, for Jaime, but. Um, no, I was just, I just mentioned about the, you know, this, um, the, you know, the brown tide that we had coming through last summer and the impact that it had on, you know, so many animals, the, the, the seabirds and marine mammals, um, the fish themselves, and the dramatic uh, economic, economic losses that, that I think a lot of coastal communities had because people just didn't want to be in the water. It was, it looked like 
really bad flat root beer out there for you know weeks and weeks on end. Um, and it was all it all tied back to the uh, you know the waste and wastewater streams coming into the bay and the the fact that we really are not addressing how to improve the quality of um, you know treated wastewater and industrial waters that are that are uh, released out into the bay and especially at times when there's kind of low exchange um, just due to lack of, of rainfall. Now we kind of have the other problem, <laughs> a lot of flooding and, and snow melt to come that we really don't know what the impacts are going to be. So I think, you know, really looking at how we as a community can, can put more pressure on um, dealing with some of the infrastructure that is very aged and antiquated and thinking about the impacts that it has on life underwater. And then the other thing I wanted to say, and thanking Jaime for, for mentioning rockfish and their importance, because, you know, how many times we go in a restaurant and we see, you know, red snapper, but it's really a rockfish here locally. Um, but those animals, they're a very important food source for the seabirds, but also they, a lot of the rockfish eat young and, and coming along sea urchins, which we're seeing the sea urchin barrens out there. And of course, the, the sea stars and star or starfish, whichever you care to call them, they obviously eat a lot of the, the urchins, but so do the rockfish. Um, but we we've seen the the not really very much um, decrease in demand for um, rockfish or protection for rockfish. And I think if we you know protect some of those species as well, that we'll see maybe get a handle on um, some of the the multiple pressures that are uh, really seeing a reduction in the kelp forest cover and give it a chance to come back. But we need, we need, we need all the urchin munchers out there um, in full effect to, to kind of get some of these kelp forests coming back online. Great, thank you, uh, Liz. Skip, did you say that there was another question out there? Uh, that hand has uh, <laughs> disappeared. So I don't, if anyone has a, a question, just jump right in here, unmute yourself and see if Jaime can answer it for you. Okay, uh, I have a question, um, Jaime. You mentioned about microplastics um, and the problem, and we've been reading about this and hearing about this. Is there any kind of legislation going on mm. to minimize or stop the production of like fleece clothing or this kind of thing that you're aware of? That would be beyond what I really know about this. I know that we there's there was uh, regulations to stop the use of microbeads and some of cosmetics and things that we use. I think for uh, the microplastics will require us to have better filtration systems in our washers and dryers, and um, that I hope that is coming. Uh, but some of the um, this work done by one of our students at the Yale Center. Um, we took the fibers to be analyzed and quite a few of them, the larger part of them were um, human-made cellulose from ropes. So it, it was not just clothing. So that's from gear that is in the water. So that, that there are other things that, that need, may need to be changed. Um, the other thing that we're doing now, trying to understand what are the components that bind to those plastics and what is the potential implications to the to the wildlife, to their health by having that um, go, like having those components make it into the food web and into their systems. And as I said, a lot of this is, a lot of the microplastic research is fairly new, really. Well, I, I, if there are no more questions, that concludes our Q&A. Thanks once again, Jaime for your presentation. And uh, Ro has a uh, an announcement. Yes, um, Jaime, thank you very much for that. And if you'd like to learn more about Point Blue and what they're all about, which is very broad and interesting, um, pointblue.org is where you can go. And, um, Point Blue is offering anybody in this meeting today a free one-year membership, which would include um, uh, receiving their award-winning newsletter, the Point Blue Quarterly, 
and you would receive an invitation to their annual celebration meeting coming up in June and an invitation to see bird banding and other scientific demonstrations out at their Palomarin field station in Bolinas. So uh, if you're interested in finding out more or taking advantage of that, please contact Nancy Gamble, the philanthropist for Point Blue. Nancy, I think you're here. Yes, Maybe. I am. Hi, everybody. I hope you all reach out to me. I'm happy to chat with you. Thanks, Nancy. So that's ngamble at pointblue.org. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Uh, well, it's it's over to me, uh, Skip. Uh, so uh, listen, uh, I just wanted to, to thank our two speakers. Our goal is to get uh, you know, two different perspectives, we, we think, globally and locally um, this, on these broad topics. And boy, what could be broader than uh, the oceans? <laughs> uh, and I think our speakers did a great, great job, really good information. And we should applaud them, not just for that, but for the work. So thank you again very much. Really great to have you. Um, and uh, we, we will now uh, do a little closing out uh, uh, with a couple of other issues. And uh, we'd like to bring in members of our community to talk a little bit. And the first of those is Ella Clark, no relation, uh, of Tano Pius High School Model UN. Uh, and uh, she's going to tell us a little bit about uh, the recent conference. But first, I just want to say uh, why the Model UN is is important to us is obviously we want to promote the ideals of the UN. That's our that's our goal and the U.S. participation uh, in the UN, which is a questionable thing at times in in this uh, in this country. Um, so the model UN is a great way of doing that. Uh, so uh, without, without further ado, uh, Ella, if you would unmute and let me know when to start sharing the screen, I'll be doing that. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Um, sorry if you can't really hear me that well, but um, my name is Ella. Um, I'm a senior at Temple Pius High School, and I have been the president of the Model United Nations Club for two years now. Um, so I ran as a sophomore, and then my first year was as a junior. Um, but I've been involved in, with the program um, all four years. Um, so yeah, Paul, if you'd like to start sharing the slides, it'll open with a picture of us at the National Model United Nations Conference, which I'll talk about a bit later. But um, thank you. Um, we have about 20 members in our club and we meet weekly to discuss exactly what you guys are discussing. Actually, um, each week we focus in on one of the sustainable development goals. Um, and we have a debate centered around that where we discuss kind of like root causes and then also propose um, super creative solutions to these things. And at the end we vote on our proposed resolutions um we also attend a lot of different conferences um like we attended berkeley model united nations so that's the one that you see berkeley we attended the san francisco model united nations which is at um lowell high school in san francisco that one's also international and then we have some local ones as well so we have the redwood model united nations some of you may be familiar with redwood high school we also attended the Bay Model United Nations, so that's the Bay School in San Francisco. And then Tam actually hosted our own Model United Nations conference as well in October. So that was really exciting. Um, and then of course the big one, which is the one that you guys are seeing on the screen right now, is the National High School Model United Nations Conference. Um, and this is the United Nations Model United Nations Conference. Um, so in this picture, we're actually standing in the United Nations General Assembly in New York, which is where the conference is held. Um, it's super, super an amazing experience. And it's the first time that Tam has been able to go since COVID began. So I technically attended the um, NISMUN is what we call it. I technically attended NISMUN last year, but I was online. So I didn't get the full experience, unfortunately. Um, but Paul, if you could just go to the next slide. So because this is the United Nations, Model United Nations Conference, um, we get a lot of super, super amazing speakers. So on the left um, is Saba Korosi, I believe his name is pronounced. Um, and he's actually president of the United Nations General Assembly, which is super amazing. 
Um, and he spoke at our opening session along with Akeem Steiner, who's the administrator of the UNDP and he's the chairman of the UNSDP. Um, and both of them spoke about the importance of youth engagement in these, um, with these topics. They spoke about their jobs. Um, keep in mind, there were 2,000 high school students attending this conference representing over 70 different countries. Um, so it was just an amazing like international experience. Um, and again, yeah, they really focused in on the importance of youth participation in um, politics and international diplomacy. Um, yeah, and then Paul, if you could go to the next slide, please. This um, was in the United Nations General Assembly. As I said, we got to go and actually like sit in the seats, which is super, super cool. Um, our school was representing the delegation of Madagascar. So that was really fun. Um, but yeah, so in the General Assembly, um, we spoke to Ahmed Bader of the UN Envoy on Youth, who actually published a book called While the Earth Sleeps, We Travel, which I highly recommend you all check out. Um, it is a collection of short stories, poetry, and art from re young refugees like himself. Um, so he works very closely with the UNHCR um, and then also UNICEF. Um, so yeah, super, super amazing, really amazing speakers. Um, and if you go to the next slide, so normally um, at NISMAN, when you're representing a country, you get a mission briefing um, from the representative of the country that you're actually representing. So like the real Madagascar delegation. Um, however, because the Madagascar delegation couldn't make it for some reason and um, the school that was representing Moldova couldn't make it. So we got put with the Moldovan representative to the United Nations. Um, and for those of you that don't know, Moldova is right below Ukraine. So it's like Russia, Ukraine, Moldova. Um, so we got to like this super unique insight into the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the conflict that's going on there. Moldova has a really similar history um, with Ukraine, um, like their relationship to the Soviet Union and to Russia is very similar. Moldova is an independent country. Russia does not necessarily recognize them. Um, so yeah, it was amazing to speak to him. Um, I mean, I, his main point was basically like Moldova's next. If we don't step in and do something about Ukraine, Moldova's next. Um, and he also provided a lot of insight into their energy crisis, which a lot of countries in Europe are experiencing. Um, they get most of their oil and gas from Russia, who is actively trying to invade them. So um, yeah, it was just such an amazing experience. We were super, super lucky. Um, his name is Jorge Luca. I don't think I'm pronouncing it right, but yeah, he's the representative of Moldova to the UN and he's the guy in the middle there. Um, so it was just our school talking to him. Um, so that was super, super awesome. Um, yeah, that's kind of my presentation. <laughs> um, yeah, we definitely would love to like connect with you guys more as a club kind of. Um, I have been plugging you guys a little bit, um, but I will say it is the end of the year. So a lot of people are kind of starting to wind down. Um, I wish that more people had shown up today. Unfortunately, it's only me, <laughs> but um, hopefully that will change. And yeah, does anybody have any questions, suggestions, comments, anything? <laughs> Ella, thank you so much. Um, and yeah, I guess we, I'm sure we have a minute if anybody has a question, but I want in, in the chat, put the name of the book and maybe uh, if anybody does want to write to you or see more about the TAM High School Model UN, what the website is. Yeah, sorry, I'm putting kind of like put all the stuff in the chat right now. Oh, okay. um, yeah. So while the earth sleeps, oh no, that was just to James T. I'm so sorry, James T. Okay, the name of the book it. is um, "While the Earth Sleeps, We Travel," and then our 
um, website is camelpiousmun.weebly.com because we cannot afford our own domain name. So we have to use the Weebly domain name. <laughs> um, to answer James's question about is Moldova still trading with Russia for energy? So um, there's this like sub region of Moldova called it starts with a T and I'm completely blank on the full name, but um, they actually have declared themselves independent from Moldova, although Moldova doesn't recognize it. Um, and they like want to join up with Russia again. So Russia currently does have a pipeline that sends oil to Moldova, but that oil is going directly to that region. And then the rest of Moldova takes their gas and oil from um, the country right next door, which I'm also totally blanking on. Um, but they have like um, formed kind of a pact there um, of trying to become more reliant on each other as a, and then also with Ukraine in that as opposed to Russia. All right, thank you, Ella. I just, I do see, although we're winding down here that Kim Weichel and Nancy Gamble have questions. Well, Kim? Say, uh, thanks, Kim. Uh, thank you, Ella. You know, I love your enthusiasm and I love Model UN. And I'm wondering for those of us that want to come observe, can we come in October when you have your Model UN and come to TAM and, and observe? Is that possible for the public? Yeah, so actually I will not be here next year. I'm graduating this year, but um, you guys are welcome. We meet every Wednesday at lunch. <laughs> <laughs> in Mr. Garfink's room, 147, I think it is. <laughs> so you're welcome to come in and sit. And I really do want to try. We're actually starting elections for next year. Um, but I do want to uh, like maybe have some of you guys come in and talk more about the program in depth because I did give a brief presentation, but I'm not the most qualified to speak on um, the Marin United Nations Association. So yeah, we'll definitely connect about potentially having you guys come in, but you're welcome to show up anytime you want. <laughs> right. Okay, uh, now, Nancy, if you can just hold on after we shut down here with your question, uh, Paul's going to wrap up uh, our meeting now. Take it away, Paul. Right. Well, we actually have, uh, thank you so much, uh, Ella, uh, for, uh, for your energy and, and knowing anything about Moldova and parents of Istria. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so bravo to you. Uh, thank you. I know everyone's feeling the same thing. Uh, thank God we have the young generation. Um, okay, so we, we actually have one short bit, and uh, we should, you just saw her. She just spoke briefly, uh, Kim Weichel. Uh, uh, we, we give her uh, a couple of minutes. She's the former president of this chapter of San Francisco, and she worked as a major player in the, the biggest chapter in Washington, D.C., and she's worked with you and uh, also. So, uh, Kim, uh, if you want to uh, hop in for a couple minutes and tell us uh, tell us what's uh, what's up. Sure. So thanks, Paul, and great program. Very important topics. So as everyone I'm sure knows, uh, the UN has many agencies carrying out its wide uh, variety of work, as well as commissions, conventions, initiatives. So I thought I'd just say for a few moments, Paul asked me to talk about something to do with the UN recently. The Commission on the Status of Women just concluded its annual meetings at the UN. So the commission, or CSW as it's known, it really promotes gender equality and advancement of women. In many ways, it sort of sets the global stage on gender equality. It's the UN's principal uh, body on women, uh, and it monitors and reviews progress on gender equality at the national, regional, and global levels. So the commission is made up of gender advisors, gender ministers from every country. They meet for two weeks, starting around International Women's Day, March 8th, running you know, for two weeks in March, um, on looking at the gender equality progress in their country, uh, looking at common challenges, and then working on an outcome document, along with some NGOs, that sets goals and priorities for the next year. So while they're meeting behind closed doors, thousands of women, and I mean thousands, meet in buildings around the UN. Um, and it is just a riveting for me experience. I've been 10 times to the commission. Um, NGO leaders, I mean, anyone can go, it's actually free. 
The cost, of course, is getting to New York and staying there. Um, but you get to meet women from all over, women from Afghanistan, and telling you what's, what's really been happening there on the ground, or women from Syria and working on the front lines, or women who have defected from North Korea. It's remarkable, really, the stories one can hear. But uh, NGOs can submit workshops, uh, proposals on the theme, which this year was innovation and tech technological change. And so there are a wide variety of workshops starting at 8.30 every morning, running all day long, simultaneous workshops. The hardest part is choosing where to go. Uh, but you know, it's the people you meet, it's the quality of the conversations, it's looking at lessons learned, it's looking at examples that we learn from each other and we share. So it really is uh, a, an eye-opening and remarkable experience that happens every year. So again, anyone can go. If the NGO has UN accreditation, which is not easy to get, but some do, um, then you'll have access through some tickets to get into the UN itself and listen to some of the UN dialogues. Uh, so um, if you're interested, you should wait for the announcements. They come out late in the year registration, again, it's free, is usually in January or so. Uh, it's always two weeks in March, so keep an eye out. And if you'd like, I can put my email in the chat if anybody has any particular questions. So I just wanted to share that brief bit. Thanks, thanks so much. It's always good to hear the amazing things you're doing. And uh, yeah, no, really thank you for, for participating. Um, okay, well, we are, we're, we're reaching the end of our uh, of our event. Um, as we mentioned, uh, uh, again, uh, thanks to all the speakers. Really, really appreciate the work you do and the fact that you spared, shared some time with us. We will be sending out an email with a link to the recording and the information about Point Blue and uh, DOER. Um, we do have uh, upcoming events. Uh, this is our chapter logo. Uh, and uh, we are going to do an uh, SDG uh, 15, uh, a life on land. Uh, that will be a, an email or going out in summer. We don't have a date picked uh, yet. Uh, and then we have a, a presentation, oddly enough, by me uh, with one of our partners, uh, the World Affairs Council, on the 19th of, uh, of April. So in 11 days, you can hear about uh, the mistakes we've made in the war on terror, uh, something, unfortunately, on which I'm quite experienced in. Uh, anyway, we uh, members get the uh, same as the same rate uh, as the World Affairs Council, and you can see that um, uh, that the website is worldaffairs.org. Uh, and then um, becoming a member, if anyone is interested in in spending some time with us after the call, the uh, some of the board members will be around. And we can talk about what we do in the UN. We can talk a little bit about the UN. Uh, we can also talk about the. Uh, uh, the work we want to do to support the model you in. So Ella, you're you're welcome to to come. Um, and anyway, uh, thank you very much again on behalf of the the board of the World Affairs, excuse me, of the uh, UN Association of Berlin. Thank you so much for all your uh, all your attention and good questions. And thank you to our speakers one last time. You stop sharing and and uh, and wish you all a good good weekend. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thank you. Happy Thank you, Easter, Joan. Passover, and all. Oh, yeah, there we are. Thank you. Former board member, Joni. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Corinna. Thank you, Liz. Uh, Great uh, event. Thank you so much. Yeah. I really, really appreciated Thank having you. you. Uh, I think Amy's yeah, left. Uh, Herb, thank you for coming in. Sue, I'm sorry, I didn't uh, mention Sue, former U, uh, San Francisco chapter president. Uh, okay. Uh, so anyway, so this is sort of an open forum for anyone who has any questions about the you know, the UNA uh, and the work we do or uh, any other follow-up uh, questions. And uh, let's see, who do we have here? We got Ro, who is our adv advocacy chair. Uh, and then uh, uh, Treasurer Chip and yep. uh, Annette Miller, former board member. Uh, Bonnie, uh, you should be wearing two or three hats because you do two or three things. Uh, Secretary of membership. Uh, and then uh, and then me, I'm the president again <laughs> of the chapter. Uh, we have uh, Greg and James and then someone from uh, 510. Is that Rose's phone? Is that your phone, Greg? 
Yeah. Um, I just want to say, Greg, yes. I don't know if he's still on, but he's not showing his face. That's but, okay. Um, I think that becoming a member it has to do with like one-on-one -on -one <laughs> friendships. <laughs> so, Greg, you're next. He's moved up to Oregon. But, um, <laughs> right. we, so, oh, Ro and I... Ro and I had a low carbon footprint lunch with him and we kept on talking about what we eat can influence climate, the climate crisis. And so he, he was questioning, you know, what we were doing. We said to, to come on board today. I don't know, Greg, are you there? It doesn't matter. Don't answer. I'll talk to you later. <laughs> Connect you with some good people up in Oregon. Right, right. James, good. thank you for asking some good questions. Yes, yes, definitely. Sounds like you're pretty involved and conscious about what's happening with some of these issues around the Bay Area. And I'm not sure who our phone person on the phone is, but thank you for joining us today. Annette, great to see you as always. Yeah, Annette, you're looking good. Okay, well, thank you, uh, everybody. Uh, thank you, Ro, particularly for a lot of work. Uh, our our Super 10 speaker, Skip and Bonnie, thank you so much uh, for yeah. all the stuff you've done. Uh, yeah. uh, and uh, I guess we'll see you all on the 20th. Yep, we'll see you right. at the board meeting. Board meeting yeah. then. And until then, everybody take care. Have a great Sunday. And I just want to say, as treasurer, that uh, we did receive a, another nice uh, 